All right, we're on. This is lecture five, I believe. Um, and uh, Richard will introduce the time periods that it takes place in. Thanks for joining us in New York and abroad. Um, OK, uh, first of all, happy Bastille Day, a holiday which has now just become a French national holiday, but which actually is a universal one and was also the anniversary of the founding of the Second International on the 100th anniversary of Bastille Day. Uh, so anyway, we're in the period 1933 to 1940, and I'll basically be focused on that, though I'll go a bit forward and a bit back um, on occasion. So can, can everyone hear me? So we're starting with a paradox. Trotskyism begins not with the consolidation of Stalin's dictatorship, but rather with that of Hitler's. From 1923 to 1933, according to Trotsky himself, his watchword was reform, not revolution. But both those dates, 1923 and 1933, are primarily determined by events in Germany. The fate of classical Marxism has to an extraordinary degree been determined by two countries, Germany and Russia. This is not how it would have been imagined by Marx and Engels, certainly not backward Russia. Germany, of course, was another story, but they also would have expected England and France, the pioneers of bourgeois revolution in the 17th and 18th century, and America, the capitalist colossus, to have played a larger role. It was, however, these two countries, Russia and Germany, that were to be central to the fate of Marxism. So last week we read Trotsky on Britain, Germany, and China. But important as Britain and China have been in world history, the fate of the Comintern was actually decided in Germany. In no other advanced capitalist country, in this or in fact in any other period, were there to be so many missed revolutionary opportunities. And in none was the significance of their being missed so great for the rest of the planet. No country outside of the Soviet Union had as large a communist party combined with such industrial resources. The potential union of Germany and Russia as a revolutionary force that would dominate Europe and then the world was central to the Bolshevik vision. Remember also that during this period, Europe still contained more than a quarter of the world's population and the majority of the world's productive capacity, although the United States had already become the leading economic power in the world. Nowadays, Europe is only about 10% of the population of the world. In a fundamental sense, the Versailles Treaty was aimed at containing both Germany and Russia. One can, in a certain sense, say, therefore, that Nazism from the right and communism from the left were the two political challenges to the Versailles system. Now, since Trotskyism and classical Marxism in general have often unfairly been characterized as Eurocentric, let me just make one tangential but rather provocative point here. To the extent that the victory of socialism in Europe in the late 19th and early 20th centuries would almost certainly have led to the triumph of socialism on a world scale, one must to some extent regret the relative decline of Europe. I mentioned that, say, 25% of the world population versus, say, 10% vis-a-vis -vis other continents, particularly America and Asia. This globalization of capitalist power has probably made the victory of socialism on a world scale harder rather than easier, though the fundamental political problems remain the same and are not affected by that. Now, the issue of dates has come up often during these lectures. Spencer, for example, raised the issue of 1923 versus 1919. These two are basically German dates. So a revolution in Hungary in 1919 or in Bulgaria in 1923 was bound to be a sideshow. The central battle was in Germany both times. Both times the left lost almost as soon as it had begun. There were also uh, uprisings in Germany in 1921. And, um, but in both 1919 and 1923, many people, including many people who are not at all sympathetic to the idea, hostile to the idea, saw a very serious possibility of a German revolution. A different set of dates is the opposition between 1921, the year of Kronstadt, and the ban on party factions in the Soviet Union, and 1928-29, the end of open political debate in the Soviet Union. 
The period 1920 to 21 in Germany is also very significant because you saw the Kapp Putsch and then the formation of the Vereinigte Kommunistische Partei Deutschland, which brought the communists who merged with the, the, the left USPD out of sectarian isolation and witnessed a move to the left by German workers when the, after the Kapp Putsch was stopped. So each of these days, 1919, 1921, 1923-24, 1928-29, and potentially others, raise political issues and pose the question of how one views the significance of the Bolshevik Revolution. They all have merits. But I want here to propose 1933 as a central turning point. I've dealt with this date before for Platypus in the decline of the left in the 20th century series, and there I counterpose Trotsky and Benjamin to Roosevelt and Hitler. The latter, whom I said, merely constituted the real history of the 20th century, whereas the former represented its unfulfilled possibilities. A twilight character, therefore, hovered around this date, 1933, for me. The world was getting very dark, but night had not yet fallen. Before 1933, the left had experienced setbacks, but one could still tie these to the rhythm of revolution. It was still not absurd to imagine revolutionary possibilities in Germany up to the early 1930s, and the effect of a revolution in Germany on a still not fully formed Stalinist dictatorship would have been immediate and profound. If Stalin's policies helped pave the way for Hitler, as Trotsky points out, Hitler's victory also helped consolidate Stalinism. It was the threat of Nazism that made the Popular Front and reconciled liberals to the accomplished fact of the Stalinist dictatorship. The wonderful piece we read this week, the Mary McCarthy, that Jeremy pointed out, you know, where you see how popular Stalinism was with liberals for much of the 1930s. Again, this popularity of Stalinism among liberals was largely a post-fascist phenomenon. It was a response to fascism and the victory of fascism, which ironically, of course, the Stalinists played a big role in facilitating, as Trotsky correctly points out. Now, to suggest that Trotskyism actually begins in 1933 is somewhat at odds, though, with the orthodox Trotskyist narrative, which tends to bring it back to 1923 and the beginning of the left opposition. Um, and this raises several questions. Trotskyism, though, insofar as any one thing, is not, as Mike McNair would have it, adherence to the first four congresses of the Communist International, nor is it the transitional program nor even opposition to socialism in one country, which before Stalinism was simply treated as Marxist common sense. To understand Trotskyism, one must not do what Trotskyists necessarily do, which is to treat Trotskyism as program. So if not program, what then is this odd beast Trotskyism that we're talking about? It is, I will argue, simply the problem of classical Marxism in extremis. In this, by the way, there's an analogy to platypus, for platypus is the idea of the left itself in extremis. So here we are more concerned with how Trotsky and Trotskyism dealt with the new problems thrown up by history, by their explanations, not the idea of programmatic continuity. Now, an orthodox Trotskyist narrative will tend to pose the central question between Stalinism and Trotskyism as the question of socialism in one country. I think, however, that for our purposes, this orthodox conception, valid as it is, it is a valid conception in terms of a difference between Trotsky and Stalinism, can be obscuring, just as much as, say, the popular notion of Trotsky as the anti-Stalinist, which he was, or the believer in workers' democracy, which he was, with qualifications, of course. First of all, it is certainly not the case that Trotsky or any other Bolsheviks opposed building socialism in Russia. On the contrary, Trotsky and the left opposition were the most consistent advocates of a policy of industrialization. One could say, therefore, that Stalin, after 1929, dished the Whigs, as Disraeli put it. Disraeli was the leader of the Conservative Party, and he essentially took over the liberal platform of, of uh, greatly expanding suffrage, and he spoke of this as dishing the Whigs. Um, and and the, the, the Stalinists, of course, adopted, albeit with outrageous bureaucratic terror, the policy of the left opposition, which hitherto they'd opposed. We're speaking internally within the Soviet Union in terms of the policy of a crash course of industrialization. 
And this was one of the reasons that many disoriented left oppositionists after 1929 abandoned their opposition to Stalin. They said, well, Stalin's adopted our program. Similarly, it's not the case that subjectively, at any rate, Stalinists, and for the early period, remember we're talking also of Bukharinists and Zinovievists, as well as Trotskyists and Stalinists, had abandoned hopes for revolution in their own countries. Later, some of these Stalinists, to the considerable confusion of Trotskyists, would indeed carry out successful revolutions. Now, by successful revolution, I want to be very clear. I mean merely overturning the capitalist means of production. I'm not addressing the question of proletarian democracy here or the ultimate Marxist goal of human emancipation. So in this sense, Mao and Lenin both led successful revolutions, but Rosa Luxemburg did not. And Trotskyists, except for Trotsky himself, of course, have never led a successful revolution. Now, I'm not thus addressing the question of whether Lenin's revolution and Mao's might not have a different character. I think they do, radically. Or whether Rosa Luxemburg might not be preferred to Mao as a theoretician, even though she was a failure in Mao's success. Obviously, I do think she should be preferred to Mao as a theoretician. And when Stalinism collapsed in 1989, real existing socialism existed in many countries. The problem is that the slogan of socialism in one country was a symptom of a much deeper conceptual problem. In f is it working? Mm -hmm. Okay. In fact, that real existing socialism existed in many countries is itself symptomatic. In its origin, the Soviet Union was not seen as a country, but as a multinational federation of areas liberated from capitalism. Soon one hoped the Soviet Union would cover the entire planet and the international would indeed be the human race. One cannot therefore simply say, although it is true in the end, that Stalin represented a conservative nationalist bureaucratic response and Trotskyism the opposite. This does not fully do justice to the complexity of either historic antagonist, nor does it adequately explain the meaning of Trotsky's defeat. So last week, for example, we had Trotsky's writings on China, quite brilliant and prescient. But in the end, the revolution in China was not carried out by Chinese Trotskyists. There were some gathered around the historic leader of Chinese communism, Chen Dushu, for example. Um, so there's a danger, I think, that lurks in the orthodox Trotskyist tendency to merely point out how right Trotsky was again and again against Stalin and other Bolsheviks or in the case of China, also Bukhara. Um, for example, in the, in the case of China, so one is faced with the theoretical problem of understanding the ultimate triumph of Stalinism, despite its betrayal by Stalin. So what does the ultimate victory of the Maoist Stalinists in 1949 then say about Trotsky's criticisms in 1927? And more especially, one also needs to note the timing of Trotsky's criticisms. So for most of the time during which the Chinese issue was developing, it remained as if outside the inner party, the Russian inner party controversy. As Deutsche very correctly observes, this fact deserves to be underlined. It disposes of one of the legends of vulgar Trotskyism, which maintains that the opposition had from the beginning unremittingly resisted Stalin and Bukharin's betrayal of the Chinese revolution. No doubt Trotsky himself had misgivings as early as the beginning of 1924. He then expressed at the Politburo a critical view of the adherence of the Chinese communists to the Guomintang, and in the following two years restated his views on a number of occasions. But he did it almost casually. He did not dwell on the matter and did not go to its heart. When he found that in the Politburo he stood alone, all other members backed the Chinese policy, he did not try to repeat his objections before the wider form of the Central Committee. Not once, it seems, in those years, 1924 to 1926, did he speak about China in the executive or the commissions of the common term. Not once, at any rate, did he allude in public to any difference of opinion on the matter. He appears to have given it far less weight than he gave British or even Polish communist policies. He was evidently not clearly aware of the force of the tempest breaking over China and of the magnitude and gravity of the approaching crisis in communist policy. Um, also, the people who like one of the people who set up the policy in terms of the Kuomintang was one of uh, people like Yafin 
Yaffa were, was later one of Trotsky's supporters. Um, early in 1926, he was still concerned more closely with the conduct of Soviet diplomacy towards China than with the direction of communist affairs there. He even presided over a special commission, Chicharin, Dzerzhinsky, and Voroshilov were its members, which was to prepare recommendations for the Politburo on the line that Soviet diplomacy ought to pursue in China. As Trotsky did not dissociate himself from the report, it must be assumed that he was in basic agreement with it. The commission made its recommendation in strictly diplomatic terms without reference to the objectives of the Chinese Communist Party. While the party strove in cooperation with the Guomintang to abolish the status quo in China, the commission offered instructions for the Soviet diplomatic services on the attitude they should adopt within the status quo. Both the CCP and the KMD, the Chinese Communist Party and the Guomintang, called for the political unification of the country. <coughs> That is for the overthrow of the Chang Solin, Chang Solin, the warlord government, whose writ ran in the north, and for the spread of revolution from south to north. But the assumptions of the commission that Trotsky shared remained premised on the continuing warlord domination and the security needs of the Soviet state, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Japan. Then for a whole year, from April 1926 till the end of March 1927, neither Trotsky nor the other leaders of the opposition took up the issue. Only Radek, who since May 1925 had headed the Sun Yat-sen University in Moscow and had to expand party policy to perplex Chinese students, pestered the Politburo for guidance. This he failed to obtain, and he expressed mild misgivings. On the 26th of July, four months after the Politburo had discussed the report of Trotsky's commission, Chiang Kai-shek, ignoring Soviet councils of moderation, so it wasn't just moderation vis-a-vis -vis the Communist Party, but also Chiang Kai-shek, issued his marching orders for the northern expedition. Against Moscow's expectation, their appearance in China acted as a tremendous stimulus to a nationwide revolutionary movement. The northern and central provinces were astir with rising since Chang Solin's administration and the corrupt warlords who supported it. The urban risings were the most active elements in the political movement. The Communist Party was in the ascendant. It led and inspired the risings. Its members stood at the head of the trade unions, which had sprung into being overnight and found enthusiastic support in liberated cities and towns. All along the route of Chiang Kai-shek's advance, the peasantry welcomed his troops and, counting on their support, rose against warlords, landlords, and usurers. Chiang Kai-shek was frightened by the tide of revolution and sought to contain it. He forbade strikes and demonstrations, suppressed trade unions, and sent out punitive expeditions to subdue the peasants. Chen Dushu, this time still the leader of the Communist Party, and later a supporter of Trotsky after he was kicked out of the party, reported these events to Moscow, demanding that his party should at least be authorized to make its exit from the Guomintang. He was still for a united front with the Guomintang against the northern warlords and the agencies of the western powers, but he held that it was imperative for his party to shake off the Guomintang's discipline, regain freedom of maneuver, encourage the proletarian movement in the towns, back the peasantry struggle for land, and get ready for open struggle. But it was only on March 31st, after long delay, that Trotsky finally spoke up. The fact, therefore, that the opposition applied itself to China so late and with so many mental reservations weakened its stand from the beginning. The policy which was in the next few weeks to produce the debacle had been pursued for at least three long years. It could hardly have been reversed within two or three weeks. Even if Trotsky was resolving that he could no longer keep silent when the head of the Chinese proletariat was at stake, that head was already under the blows of Chiang Kai-shek's hammer blow. When the opposition then denounced Stalin and Bukharin as those responsible, they retorted by asking where the opposition had been and why it had been kept silent during those three long years. They plausibly suggested that the critics' indignation was spurious, that the opposition had been on the lookout for a debating point, and that it grasped at the Chinese issue as a drowning man grasped at a straw. These rejoinders were not wholly undeserved. Stalin further brought to light inconsistencies in the opposition's attitude and exploited to the utmost the difference between Trotsky and his colleagues. But this does not alter the fact that the opposition's criticisms, even if belated and half-hearted, were justified. As to Trotsky, throughout those fateful weeks, day after day, he struggled with all his courage and energy for a last-minute revision of policy. His analyses of the situation were of crystalline clarity. His prognostications were faultless, and his warnings were like mighty alarm bells. Now, we must indeed avoid this error of what Deutscher calls vulgar Trotskyism. 
Because for us, the issue is no longer to rescue Trotsky from Stalinist slanders or to prove the superiority of his policies to those adopted by the Comintern and official communist parties. I take this all for granted. But even if Trotsky's prognostications were faultless, and in some quite important cases they were not, and if even if Trotsky did heroically ring mighty alarm bells that unfortunately were ignored, not just in China, but Germany, all over the place, we must still ask ourselves whether Trotskyism constitutes a coherent body of thought as the continuation of Marxism. Now, amid the general ruins of what was once official communism, Trotsky remains a romantic figure. This romantic allure undoubtedly poses a problem of evaluation. For against this romanticism, two attitudes tend to form, one of enchantment and seduction, the other of suspicion and resistance. I remain, I admit, still entranced by this romantic character. Now, by accident, recently, in an obituary of the British Trotskyist Duncan Howes, not a very significant figure, a bit of a SWP hack, actually, but anyway, I came on a phrase that perfectly summed up this romanticism for me. It was, the sheer dazzling power of the word is nowhere grander than for Trotskyism, where the paltry means to do anything are so ill-matched to its gigantic historical ambitions. Remind anyone of Platypus. Um, now, in reviewing the history of Trotskyism, one is in fact struck by this sheer dazzling power of the word contrasted with the indeed truly paltry means. Now, in the same text, this obituary of Duncan Hallis, I then continued to read about Hallis, who at the age of 15 in 1943 was a young working-class boy who was shopping for left-wing pamphlets. And outside of a shop, he met a woman, Rachel Ryan, selling Socialist Appeal, the publication of the Trotskyist Workers International League, which he then joined. So far, I was still charmed. But then came a horrifying shock, a single phrase. Duncan Hallis, the obituary writer continues, made the wager, no doubt with that careless courage of which only the young are capable, as if like cats they had nine lives and could afford to lose half a dozen before worrying about mortality. As clear for Duncan, well, this is the horrifying phrase, as clear for Duncan as for the stunning courage of the Palestinian suicide bombers. But it carried him throughout his life. Duncan, not the Palestinian suicide bombers, obviously. <laughs> Here, I immediately became intensely depressed. How could it happen that latter-day followers of Trotsky could confuse even for a moment a revolutionary ideology based on enlightenment principles, i.e. one based on profound hopes for a better world, and a reactionary ideology based on the despair of the oppressed? The magic spell of the sheer dazzling power of the word was broken. A vulgar Trotskyism had here betrayed Trotsky as much as a vulgar Marxism has betrayed Marx. Unfortunately, nearly all, perhaps all to one degree or another, of present-day Trotskyists have succumbed to some degree or another to this vulgar Trotskyism. The question is, why is this the case? I would suggest the following. Trotskyism, from its inception, contained tensions. These tensions were not perhaps resolvable. Thus, for example, Trotskyism continued, Trotskyism as a continuation of Second International Marxism was imbued with a profoundly democratic spirit. Furthermore, after 1933, with the twin defeats of Stalin and Hitler, the natural homeland of Trotskyism became the Western bourgeois democracies. But Trotsky and Trotskyists could by no means privilege this democracy, however, because to do so would be to betray the principles on which Trotskyism rested. So Trotsky continued to insist, for example, not only in regards to Stalinism, but also vis-a-vis -vis Hitler, that a Second World War could by no means be seen as a struggle between democracy and fascism. Marxism for Trotsky was never reducible to democracy. Similarly, a tension always existed between a respect for the facticity of the objective situation, a, reject, a recognition that a revolution cannot be made on schedule by fiat, for example, or that the collectivization of property in the Soviet Union still represented a progressive social conquest even without workers' democracy, and at the same time, an intense awareness of the subjective element of history, 
of the need for the political consciousness of the masses, of the need for revolutionary leadership, of the impossibility of a Russian revolution without a Lenin. To be a good Trotskyist seemed, therefore, to require one constantly to be a dialectician, balancing and combining at different times and different ways opposed needs. However one, much one respects Trotsky and his handling of these contradictions, one is still left with an uneasy feeling. Molotov once, when in the 1920s he was reproached by Trotsky for some sloppiness or incompetence, supposedly remarked, but comrade Trotsky, not everyone can be a genius. Trotsky's followers were far from being political geniuses, and particularly after 1940, they would be faced with problems which perhaps not even the old man, as they called him, could have solved. Trotskyists, however, with their emphasis on program and revolutionary continuity, must ignore the most interesting aspect of Trotskyism, namely its problematic character, and therefore they end up absurdly saying things like that the literally suicidal despair of Palestinians proves the validity of permanent revolution or some other nonsense. At times, too, the power of the word sometimes seems to make Trotsky, as though intoxicated with his own words, simply ignore the problem of paltry means. So in one of the readings for this week, Trotsky writes, skeptics ask, but has the moment for the creation of the Fourth International yet arrived? It is impossible, they say, to create an international artificially. It can only arise out of great events, etc., etc. All of these objections merely show that skeptics are no good for the building of a new international. They are good for scarcely anything at all. The Fourth International has already arisen out of great events, the greatest defeats of the proletariat in history. The cause of these defeats is to be found in the degeneration and perfidy of the old leadership. The class struggle does not tolerate an interruption. The third international following the second is dead for purposes of revolution. Long live the fourth international. But has the time yet arrived to proclaim its creation? The skeptics are not quieted down. The fourth international, we answer, has no need of being proclaimed. It exists and it fights. It is weak? Yes. Its ranks are not numerous because it is still young. There is yet chiefly cadres, but these cadres are pledges for the future. Outside these cadres, there does not exist a single revolutionary current on the planet really meriting the name. If our international be still weak in numbers, it is strong in doctrine, program, tradition, in the incomparable tempering of its cadres. Who does not perceive this today? Let him in the meantime stand aside. Tomorrow will become more evident. But what if it were indeed true that outside these cadres, there does not exist a single revolutionary current on this planet really meriting the name, but that that was just not enough? To Trotsky, the question was inadmissible. It called into question Marxism itself. Even what Trotsky accurately calls the greatest defeats of the proletariat in history cannot change his basic perspective. He remains, it is his, once his greatest strength and limitation, a second international radical. One cannot simply surrender to barbarism. It is a categorical imperative to engage the battle regardless of the odds. This is the, precisely the point where Platypus is most deeply challenged by Trotskyism. We do not even have the confidence to proclaim that outside Platypus there does not exist a single revolutionary current on the planet really meriting the name. For we are by no means confident of ourselves as a revolutionary current and rather tend to dismiss the possibility of any such thing in the present. But when Trotsky says this phrase in the 1930s, it is magnificent. Now to hear the same sentiment, though, except expressed by a dozen or so obscure people in a tiny Trotsky sect three quarters of a century later merely seems ridiculous. So politically, Trotsky's evolution in the period from 1923 to his death can be divided into four periods. A period from 1923 to 1929, where Trotsky is still struggling for the reform of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union from within. During this period, Trotsky seems to be criticizing the Stalinists and the others from the left. In fact, the Stalinists weren't the right, but the Karnists were the right, as we talked about before. Then, 1929 to 1933, a period where, struggling, where Trotsky is struggling against Stalin from outside the Soviet Union, but still, at least in his view, from within the communist movement. 
power. So Trotsky is now appealing to communists in countries where they are not in power. And as such, he represents the internationalist traditions of Bolshevism against the Stalinist nationalist degeneration of socialism in one country. But he's handicapped at this, this struggle by the apparent left turn of Stalin in the third period. At times, Trotsky seems now to be criticizing the common turn from the right. This is disorienting to many, including many of his followers. Finally, the catastrophe of Hitler's rise to power sends Stalin on another zigzag, now to the right, and after 1934, the Popular Front develops, and Trotsky once again appears to be a critic from the left. But by now, Trotsky is broken from the idea of reforming the Comintern, and Trotskyism exists as a new political tradition, which will even attempt to found its own international. Many of the new recruits to Trotskyism are no longer coming from the communist movement, as in the first period, from 1929 to 1933, or 1923, when it's still the left opposition, but are newly radicalizing youth, often from socialist parties, not communist ones, which in contrast to the official communist movement is fitfully moving leftward in this period. Finally, in 1939-1940, as a response to the Hitler-Stalin pact and the problems associated with the beginning of World War II, Trotsky finds himself in conflict with not just the Stalinists and Social Democrats, but many of his own followers about the nature of the Soviet Union. What is significant about this struggle, whose theoretical character we will examine much more in the next lecture, is that Trotsky continues to maintain his thesis of the continuity of the Soviet Union. Even in its degenerated Stalinist form, he continues to see it as the precious legacy of the Bolshevik Revolution. As long as it exists, 1917 survives, albeit a mutilated form. Many of his followers, however, now doubt this and see in the Soviet Union an imperialist power akin to fascism. Each stage in this process constitutes a further intensification of the problem of the Soviet Union. In the first stage, it is above all a question of reform of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. In the second stage, the Soviet Union is to be saved via the Communist International. In the third stage, even the International is abandoned, but a new fourth International sees itself as the true defender of the Soviet Union. In the fourth stage, which Trotsky refuses to accept, 1917, to the people who reject the defense of the Soviet Union, like Jackman, 1917 remains merely as the indomitable aspiration of the workers for socialism. So the ideal of 1917 exists, but nothing concretely survives. This question of the continuity-discontinuity is the inverse of the question of whether Leninism leads to Stalinism. It was easier for Stalinists and social democrats, of course, who thought that it did. I mean, with opposite valuations. Social democrats said, Stal Leninism leads to Stalinism, that's why it's bad. And Stalin said, yes, Stalin is the heir of Lenin. Trotsky, though, insists, and it's a tricky point, simultaneously that Stalinism is the negation of Leninism, but also that the Soviet Union, even under Stalinism, remains the legacy of the Bolshevik Revolution. And this will prove a difficult problem for Trotskyists. So one might think that this problem would be rendered irrelevant now by the disappearance of the Soviet Union, but it's actually only been rendered more obscure. Arguments on the left often seem like an intergenerational game of telephone. One ends up repeating a piece of bizarre gibberish because it was what was told to you or it was what you thought you heard. God knows what it will sound like in 20 years when a new generation takes over. Trotsky also correctly and immediately intuits in 1933 that Hitler's victory will inevitably entail a military showdown with the Soviet Union. Hitler is a super wrangle. Again, Russia and Germany are the fateful duo. One cannot emphasize how much this will affect the political climate of the post-war world. The fact that the USSR defeated Nazi Germany and not vice versa is one of the most significant facts of world history. The entire development of the post-war world is premised on it. All subsequent political developments, the entire rise of the, quote, third world, for example, are dependent on it. In 1945, the Red Army will enter Berlin. In 1919 and 1923, the Red Army of the Soviet Union dreamed of meeting up with the German Red Army of the victorious German proletariat. This possibility was swept away in 1933, 
But behind the gray images of Soviet soldiers raising the hammer and sickle over the Reichstag in 1945 flutter the ghosts of Luxembourg and Liebknecht in 1919, trying in a different way to raise the red flag. But these ghosts are invisible to all but a few people. Or rather, in 1945, people were more likely to be reminded of Tsar Alexander I's army occupying Paris. Actually, it was much worse than Tsar Alexander's army occupying Paris because I don't think that the Tsarist Russian army engaged in mass rape, and things like that. So Russia had been a great power again, but one could no longer remember that the Soviet Union was once a great political principle. Trotskyism obscurely keeps alive in a fragmented way these memories of the interwar period. In 1946, the Socialist Workers' Party, for example, in a document on its perspective for the post-war world, could imagine that it saw, now that the German workers were liberated from the yoke of Nazism, the German revolution around the corner. But these had now become the Träume eines Geistersehers. The political stage for Trotsky after 1933 shifts westward and southward. In the advanced capitalist world, France takes first place. It was a tra country Trotsky knew well and initially had many sympathizers in. Spain, its neighbor, the one European country where revolution was actually taking place in the 1930s, also naturally received pride of place. Both proved disappointing. So I will not linger too long on the French situation, since this is an essay on ideas, not a narrative of the twists and turns of sectarian politics, except to say that the French Trotskyism was riven by sectarianism, and at times, such as when Trotsky's son took up an affair with the wife of Moligny, leader of one of the fractions of French Trotskyism, the situation approached soap opera. Um, uh, nevertheless, France was probably the developed capitalist country where objectively the best possibilities were offered for a revolutionary breakthrough. You have to remember that at this time that Italy, Germany, Japan are all under fascist dictatorships. So basically, advanced capitalist countries had left North America, Britain, and France. And uh, politically, France was much more advanced than the Anglo-Saxon world. And it was also a, a real perceived threat of fascism in France, as well as a much larger communist and socialist party. Um, a British Trotskyism in this period remained strikingly weak. The growth in Trotskyism in Britain was a post-war phenomenon of the 1960s and 1970s. And although now Britain is probably the country where Trotskyism is the strongest, being nearly hegemonic on the British left. Um, interestingly, one of the healthiest and least sectarian Trotskyist movements in this period was the American one. This was probably due to the experienced political leadership of Cannon. Nevertheless, not even the most fervent revolutionary optimism could have seen a pre-revolutionary situation in the United States at any time in the 1930s. Milton class struggle, yes, the bourgeoisie losing its grip, no. Trotskyism in the United States did, however, win over a strata of militant workers and quite a few petty bourgeois intellectuals. Its legacy is ironically largely a result of the latter, the petty bourgeois intellectuals. Spain, however, deserves some attention for two reasons. One is that the Spanish Civil War had become an almost mythical event, has become an almost mythical event, particularly for anarchists. Now, the presence, the presence of anarchists in Spain in the 1930s gives it a unique character in leftist history, since it meant that, in a certain sense, all four internationals were represented in the, the The founding of anarchism in Spain came from Giuseppe Fanelli, a disciple of Bakunin, who arrived there in 1868 and had a developed a huge following subsequently. Um, the other is that it was the country in 1930s Europe that probably bore the greatest resemblance to pre-1917 Russia. So a comparison of the two situations lets shed some light on the uniqueness of the former, namely Russia. Furthermore, Trotsky himself devoted a great deal of attention to Spain throughout the decade of the 1930s. Unfortunately, long before the victory of Franco in the Civil War had resulted in the suppression of any revolutionary or even democratic movement in the Iberian Peninsula, Spain had become a disaster area for international Trotskyism. Largely due to Trotsky's efforts to impose upon his followers policies and tactics to which they remained opposed, the official Trotskyist movement almost disappeared in Spain before the outbreak of the Civil War in spite of attempts at the beginning of that conflict to reestablish relations between Trotsky and his erstwhile followers, these efforts proved fruitless. 
As a consequence, during the most significant European social conflict of the interwar period, a struggle in which Trotsky's ex-followers played a significant, if secondary, role, but a very significant role. By 1939, official Trotskyism in Spain amounted to not more than half a dozen people, some of whom were not even Spaniards. Evaluating the miserable failure of Trotskyism in Spain is somewhat perplexing, for objectively the conditions in Spain seemed highly auspicious. Unlike other countries where Trotsky was just criticizing the Stalinists for their errors, in Spain, Trotsky also ended up directing a lot of his attacks against his former followers, particularly Andres Nin, who was murdered by, ended up being murdered by the Stalinists. Now, one of the central differences between Trotsky and his Spanish followers was over the issue of Soviets. Trotsky, from 1930 on, based on his Russian experience, had been calling for Soviets in Spain. For some years, his Spanish followers went along with this notion, but as one of them pointed out, Spanish and Russian conditions were quite different. The Soviets had arisen in Russia, excuse me, largely because of the absence of well-established trade unions and mass-based workers' parties, where in Spain, whereas in Spain there existed strong trade unions and political um, organizations to which several generations of workers had been affiliated, and both of which exerted discipline over their followers and then were not at all ready to get out of the way to make room for a new type of workers' organization. Another perhaps even more vital issue was the problem of, quote, class collaboration. Unlike Russia and Germany, the central motive tying the Spanish workers, who were the most militant in Europe, to their bourgeoisie, their bourgeoisie, quotation mark, was not social chauvinism, but rather fear of fascism. To call, as Trotsky did, for a social revolution, however correct in principle, seemed to many radical workers to be calling for a civil war within the civil war, to declare war on Republican, Socialist, and official Communist Spain, thus handing victory to the fascists. In May 1937, street battles opened up between anarchists and the PUN, the Partido, de Opo, the Partido Obrero de Unificación Marxista, the semi-Trotskyists, who had been founded by Trotsky's followers of broke with him and some other uh, communist derived people, I think the Bloco Obrero Comunista, that's what they were called. The, the semi Trotskyists on one side versus the Stalinists, the Partidos, the, the PSUC as they were known in, in Catalonia. So it was the, the anarchists and semi Trotskyists on one side versus the, the Republican police and the Spanish Stalinists on the other. Um, now, Felix Morrow, who be hearing from in further lectures, an American Trotskyist at this time chided the, the, the PUM and the anarchists for not taking power. Morrow, echoing Trotsky, wrote that the specific conjunction in May 1937 was sufficiently favorable to enable a worker Spain to establish its internal regime and to prepare to resist imperialism by spreading the revolution to France and Belgium and then wage revolutionary war against Germany and Italy under conditions that would precipitate the revolution in fascist, the fascist countries. This, Mara says, is the only perspective in this period before the next war, whether the revolution begins with Spain or France. Whoever does not accept this perspective rejects the socialist revolution. One anarcho-syndicalist writer responded to Mara's argument as follows. No one with the least knowledge of the situation will say that the French and British masses were ready to go to war for the sake of Spain. In order to do full justice to the profundity of such a statement, one has to bear in mind that almost half of the French proletarian organizations are under the thumb of the Stalinists and the rest are under the sway of the socialists. How could a civil war waged against the socialists and Stalinists of Spain in the face of the terrific danger of the fascist breakthrough at that, fire the socialist and communist workers of France to the extent of having them lay down an ultimatum to their own bourgeoisie, demanding arms for the anarchist workers of Catalonia. Now, when Nin was murdered by the Stalinists, Trotsky acknowledged that Nin was an old and incorruptible revolutionary who had defended the interests of the Spanish and Catalan peoples against the agents of the Soviet bureaucracy, and that was why the GPU had gotten rid of him. In other words, Nin was not a renegade like Kautsky, but he was someone who had been tragically wrong in Trotsky's eyes. Significantly, Trotsky compared him to Martin, a man whom Lenin had always personally admired 
but who had been incorrigibly soft, which necessitated a political break with Lenin. Martov was the leader of the Mensheviks. Trotsky had said of Nin that he has flirted with ideas and eluded difficulties. He has impeded the creation of a revolutionary party in Spain. All the leaders who have followed him share the same responsibility. For six years, they have done everything possible to subject the heroic proletariat of Spain to the most horrible defeats. And in spite of everything, the most horrible ambiguity continues. They do not break the vicious circle. They accommodate themselves to it, and then to make up for it, they write articles on proletarian revolution. <laughs> Sounds like platypus, too. <laughs> There are basically two approaches one can take to these unfortunate developments in Spain. The orthodox approach, orthodox Trotskyist approach, is to say that of course Trotsky was right in his criticisms of his former followers. The not so orthodox approach is to blame Trotsky for being rigid, for not understanding Spanish conditions, for being mechanically fixated on Russia in 1917, etc. We will not attempt to assess blame here, but instead stand back and make the observation that in what was the last actual revolutionary situation on the European continent, so discounting, say, France in 1968 or Portugal in 1974, um, that here Trotskyism failed to have an impact, although a party largely dominated by Trotsky's ex-followers, the PUM, Partido Obrero de Unificación Marxista, played a significant role. Now, let us, for the sake of argument, except that all Trotsky's criticism were on the mark. What does this say about the future of Trotskyism? If when tested in an actual revolutionary situation, Trotskyism remained a minor sect, or its most prominent supporters, conversely, abandoned it under countervailing social pressures, what future can one expect in non-revolutionary situations, and how can one imagine Trotskyists ever leading a revolution? It is particularly if one accepts the orthodox Trotskyist position that Trotsky was right that the dilemma becomes so painfully obvious. That this problem is not painfully obvious to Trotskyists is because Trotskyists have tended to conflate for their own peace of mind the question of revolutionary leadership with being right. If we accept, for example, that say the Spartacist League has been consistently correct in its analyses, one must, th must one then conclude that they have provided adequate revolutionary leadership to the American working class over the last half century. Clearly in practice, revolutionary leadership must involve something more than telling the masses in journals they do not read the correct thing to do. One must somehow translate these ideas so that they listen to. But the problem cuts both ways. It does not follow that because X or Y group remains a tiny set that they have adopted the wrong politics. On the contrary, people are constantly adopting bad politics precisely because they are so afraid of remaining a tiny sect. Often when they adopt these bad politics, they do grow, but on the basis of their bad politics. The one Trotskyist party that ever became something like a mass party, the Lanka Sama Samaja party in Sri Lanka, did so essentially by junking Trotskyism and becoming a social democratic party. So when one comes to the arguments that divided Trotsky from his followers, how should one react, I mean, unless one is completely under the spell of orthodoxy? It's not one feels that Trotsky was wrong per se, but perhaps he was right, but in the wrong way. Or perhaps there was simply no way of being right that could have made a difference. One of the problems with Trotskyism has been the assumption that if one took the correct line, one would ultimately be rewarded. The logic is almost Calvinist. Prosperity comes to the virtues. This is one of the weaknesses of second international radicalism, a feeling that because Marxism is a scientifically correct way of understanding the world, that a correct understanding generates an adequate politics ultimately. Hence the fixation on program and all the principle splits. There have been many unprincipled splits too, but after the ignominious collapse of the second international, the main lesson learned by radicals has been the need for principle splits to avoid unprincipled unity. These problems go very deep into the history of Marxism itself. Now, I'll just finish. Now, since I've now reached this troubled and esoteric realm, let me broach a point to which I keep returning in my mind, but which nevertheless still remains quite obscure to me. And I've not formulated this quite exactly, so what I want to say is so you have to bear with me a bit. I'm groping myself for the correct formulation. <clears throat> 
Aside from 1917 itself, the date which looms largest in the imagination of Platypus is 1848. Every time 1848 is mentioned in the Platypus context, I therefore find myself thinking about its meaning. To Trotsky, however, 1848 was not a date that loomed large in his imagination, I think. Clearly, he was very aware of the history, and in his youth, it would have been a date that was still in living memory for Marxists. But in thinking about Trotsky, I have been constantly thrust back to another revolution, not to 1848, but to 1792-1794, very appropriate for Bastille Day. Trotsky's imagination is unlike Platypus, obsessed with the great French Revolution, particularly in its most radical phase. When he turns to another revolution, it's usually to the British Revolution of the 17th century. He clearly identifies with Cromwell, just as he in his first in his youth negatively, and then after 1917, positively identifies Lenin with Robespierre. But whether it is the young Trotsky attacking Lenin as a Jacobin, or the mature Trotsky conversely defending the Bolsheviks as Latter-day Jacobins, or whether it's in the central metaphor he uses to explain Stalinism, namely as Thermidor, one is thrust back beyond the 19th century by Trotsky to the very birth of the left itself in the 1790s. Is this metaphor of Thermidor, whose problems Trotsky himself acknowledges, merely a comment on or an apologia, perhaps, for the tragic necessity of terror, or does it speak to an acknowledgment of the limitations of the Bolshevik Revolution? Or is it something else? It is, after all, in many respects, an optimistic metaphor for defeat, Thermidor, because Thermidor could not permanently stop the processes unleashed by the Great Revolution something that would have been demonstrated to Trotsky by the whole history of the 19th century. But this difference between an imagination centered on 1792, 1794, and an imagination centered on 1848 seems to me, and I admit, as I said earlier, that the point remains quite obscure, quite significant to me. Perhaps the key lies in Chris's phrase in this article in the last issue of PR, that the Platypus philosophy of history of the left which seeks to grasp problems in the present as those that had already been manifest in the past but have not yet been overcome. He continues, did did 1917 and 1789 share only disappointing results, the terror and totalitarianism and an ultimately conservative oppressive outcome in Napoleon Bonaparte's empire and Stalin's Soviet Union? 1917 seems to have complicated and deepened the problems of 1789 underscoring Hegel's caveats about the terror of revolution. It would appear that Napoleon stands in the same relationship to Robespierre as Stalin stands to Lenin, but the problems of 1917 need to be further specified by reference to 1848 and hence to Marxism as a post-1848 historical phenomenon. That's Chris's friend. But if this is Platypus's estimation of this period, it is not, I think, Trotsky's or only an embryo. I think that the difference needs to be marked. In Trotsky's estimation of this period, 1917 still stood as the beginning of the overcoming. For us, this beginning has been obscured, and it may remain only as a symptom. This question is still open to us. What makes Trotsky excruciatingly difficult for Platypus then to evaluate is that by living until 1940, unlike Lenin in Luxembourg, he was able to look back on 1917 from a radically different historical era, an era characterized by apparently irrevocable defeat, and still insists that 1917 remained a beginning. For us, by contrast, 1917 has ceased to be a beginning, but it still remains a point beyond which we cannot go. So when Chris writes that the question is not so much how was Lenin a Jacobin, but rather how was Lenin a Marxist, then this question is itself one that necessarily separates us from Trotsky, at least the post-1917 Trotsky. Um, And Chris also insists in his article in the latest issue of PR that the problems of 1917 need to be further specified by reference to 1848 and hence the Marxism as post-1848 historical phenomenon. Now, undoubtedly, Trotsky and other second international radicals would have agreed with this statement as a fact. But this agreement would have meant something completely different to them from what it has means to Platypus. And this, I think, is the peculiarity of the Platypus Platypus philosophy of history, that we retrace this history, but only to experience its obscurity. 
Phrases written in the bright light of noon seem to us to be read by flickering candlelight in the dark. So I'm reminded of the well-known story by the Argentine writer Borges about a 20th century French surrealist who sets out to write Cervantes' Don Quixote in the 20th century. Borges' story appeared in Sur in 1939, a contemporary then of Trotsky's last struggles. He, Borges, writes, Cervantes' texts and Menard's are verbally identical, but the second is almost infinitely richer. More ambiguous, as detractors will say, but the ambiguity is richness. It is a revelation to compare Menard's Don Quixote with Cervantes. The latter, for example, wrote, part one, chapter nine, Truth, whose mother is history, rival of time, depository of deeds, witness of the past and advisor to the present, and the future's counselor. Written in the 17th century, written by the lay genius Cervantes, this enumeration is a mere rhetorical praise of history. Menard, on the other hand, writes, Truth, whose mother is history, rival of time, depository of deeds, witness of the past, exemplar and advisor to the present, and the future's counselor. History, the mother of truth, the idea is astounding. Menard, a contemporary of William James, does not define history as an inquiry into reality, but as its origin. Historical truth for him is not what has happened. It is what we judge to have happened. The final phrases, exemplar and advisor to the present and the future's counselor, are brazenly pragmatic. The contrast in style is also vivid. The archaic style of Menard, quite foreign after all, suffers from a certain affectation. Not so that of his forerunner, who handles with ease the current Spanish of his time. I do not know whether Platypus, too, suffers from a certain affectation. Perhaps, however, both our efforts and those of the Bolsheviks, or certainly Trotsky, are quixotic. But we are still disfaced with discovering, in the original words of Pierre Menard, la verdad cuya madre es la historia, émula del tiempo, depósito de las acciones, testigo de lo pasado, ejemplo y aviso de lo presente. Advertencia de lo porvenir. Don Quixote, clarifies Menard, interests me profoundly, but it does not seem to me to be, how should I say this, inevitable. The left, clarifies Platypus, interests me profoundly, but it does not seem to me to be, how should I say this, inevitable. Okay, questions? Questions? Uh, those in other cities, you can uh, write some questions and I will relay them. Um, I being Jeremy, the man behind the scenes. Um, I have not a question yet, but something came up uh, last week in the discussion in London that I think connects to a lot of what Richard at least for the first half talked about today. Um, is I sort of, we sort of got to this point where we talking about trucking and all. Um, and the, the comparison actually, the, the, there was sort of, there were reversal phenomena where Trotsky was right ideologically and wrong, meaning failed practically, whereas Mao was um, wrong ideologically, but right meaning succeeded practically. And, um, you know, that, that's something that I just haven't resolved, but it also, but I feel like it's something that you actually addressed this week, and maybe you could talk to. Sort of to that enough. So how, you know, if it's simply that, does that mean that all that we can take from Trotsky is ideological in sort of, sort of the positions? But even then, if it feel practically, can the insights, the positions, be truly meaningful, useful for the present or future? Or are they just some sort of, or will they remain some sort of advisory? Uh, can they even be that if they fail? Uh, Richard, you might just want to repeat that a little uh, bit. The, for, so, yeah, so. The basic question is about that the, apparently there's a discussion in London about Trotsky compared to Mao. The idea that Trotsky was right but failed and that Mao was wrong but succeeded. Um, so actually Mao will be discussed, I think, I'll mention in terms of the Trotskyist relationship to the victory of the Chinese Revolution next time. Um, I mean, I th again, politically or ideologically there are two problems. One is that to some extent, according to Trotsky's theory, Mao should not have succeeded. Like, like that's one theoretical question, that Mao succeeded. Now, one can sort of modify that and, you know, obviously most Trotskyists 
came around to the position that, well, yeah, Mao did succeed and that China was like a deformed worker state. Um, and the question is how one thinks about that and what, you know, what is the meaning of that? Um, obviously, if your goal is sort of a goal of human emancipation and workers' democracy and world revolution, uh, even the most positive evolution evaluation of the revolution of 1949 would be critical of fundamental aspects of that. Um, uh, I mean, in the period when Trotsky was alive, Mao didn't achieve any significant success. So it seemed as though um, a great opportunity had been lost forever, perhaps in 1927. And, and I think that the way the Chinese Revolution turned out was not something that Trotsky would have anticipated, or pretty much anybody at the time. I mean, I, I think that it took, would have taken most Marxists by surprise. I mean, the other thing that has to be said, I think, about the Chinese Revolution is that there wouldn't have been a Chinese successful Chinese Revolution hadn't been for World War II. I mean, in that sense, that however much you want to de-Eurocentralize the world, the fact is that the, and the Soviet Union, in other words, the fact that there was World War II, uh, that Japan and Germany were defeated, that the Soviet Union was victorious, made possible Mao's taking power. I don't think that that would have been possible except for that conjunction. I, I think that if, if Nazi Germany and Japan had won, Mao would have been crushed. So I have two questions um, from Chris. I'm just going to read them. They're a little fragmentary. Uh, the first one is um, mixed metaphor. Uh, you use 1789, 1792 to 94 as a success. 1848 is a failure. 1917 is a success. Uh, Cervantes is an early modern. Menard is a late modern. So what about the 19th century not having passed in vain? Well, I'm not, I don't think that, that, I think actually 1792, 1794 is, is not a model of success. I mean, that's the, that's why it's a different metaphor from 1848. Obviously, 1848 is a sense of failure. I think that the problem with 1792, 1794 is that the, the Jacobins were defeated. So there is this metaphor of Thermidor. The problem is that, that, I mean, it's something I haven't really worked out, but I think that, that one of the things in constantly thinking about Thermidor is the sense of, well, despite Thermidor, the bourgeois revolution in some fundamental sense unleashed by the French Revolution triumphed, right? That, that it wasn't that the monarchy was restored. In other words, I think that, that the problems raised by the 1790s are different from those raised by the sense of we live in a post-1848 moment. And I think that, that in a sense, and this goes back to the question of second international radicalism, that there was, in Trotsky's evaluation of 1848 and the second international, a greater sense of optimism about the 19th century that continued despite Hitler and Stalin, which I think gets more called in question. And I think that the, the Pierre Menard Don Quixote metaphor is also the sense of, uh, you know, the mid-century as sort of a, a kind of moment of Darkness. I mean, I mean, you could also see, if you really wanted to, you could say in, in Don Quixote, there's a lot of darkness behind the humor. I mean, it, 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 you know, Borges, it, it, it's sort of like one of the things I like about stories, Borges treats in the story Cervantes as this sort of naive writer. But he, Borges, knew that that's not who Cervantes was, and he wasn't a naive writer. And that's why he can seem 
to be made so sophisticated by Menard. And I think that the same thing one could speak about in terms of Trotsky. That Trotsky, even when he seems most naive from, say, a plot of this perspective, that he's really not that. I mean, there is some difference of sensibility, and there's a difference of period, but there is a, a, a great complexity in the original. It's not just something that has been bred into it. Um, I mean, I guess my question, Richard, is uh, so you were talking about the sort of that Trotsky was right but in the wrong way, and I don't know. I mean, it, the fact is that 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 most of his followers, I mean, I'll say in Spain, most of his followers in Spain uh, disregarded him. They said, "No, you're wrong. We're going to do what we think is right." And the few people who, who followed him, there was like a, there was an official Trotskyist group in Spain, but it was tiny. I think they were actually kicked out of the Pum, the Grupo Grupo Bolchevique Leninista, or something like that. But I mean, they had no influence. I mean, so you had one kind of semi-mass party that had some real influence, which had which was basically ex-Trotskyist and had like rejected Trotsky's advice on all sorts of issues. And then you had the people who follow him, and who might have been correct. I mean, how do you determine whether they were correct or not? I mean, maybe, you know, maybe Felix Morrow was right. Maybe, you know, maybe uh, if there had been a, a, I mean, they, they probably could have taken power in uh, Barcelona in 1937, and, you know, would that have paved the way for a fascist victory, or would it have paved the way for European revolution? You know, how do you know these things? I mean, I mean, the, what, what I what I tried to do a bit. I mean, I can't go into all the history too concretely, but I mean, I brought up like China and Spain because I wanted to sort of problematize the issues to make it not seem like a sort of simple morality lesson of Trotsky was this really smart guy who, if people had only listened to him, and it's this great tragedy that people didn't. Uh, Chris had one more question, and then we'll go to Pam. So the other question was. What about the October Revolution that was and remains the only successful workers' revolution? Uh, there's a non-symmetry of bourgeois and socialist revolutions. Bourgeois society developed under feudalism in a way socialism does not develop under capitalism. Um, well, I mean, th that's actually a point I, I, wa I wanted to, de to, to deal with, the problem of the question of the uniqueness of the Bolshevik Revolution. But I mean, Obviously, from the standpoint of Trotsky and the Bolsheviks, the uniqueness of the Bolshevik Revolution is a problem. I mean, you can't sort of just a priori accept that there was something peculiar about Russia in 1917 that can't be repeated. So the question is, why was it unique? Was it just like this string of bad luck, betrayal, etc.? I mean, that's where the problem comes in. Um, Again, you know, when you speak about like the asymmetry of bourgeois and proletarian revolution, again, like like this goes back, I think, to some extent to the problem I was raising about like 1848 versus what it tends to be Trotsky's favorite analogy of the Jacobins. I think that that it's that Trotsky, despite everything, still to some extent speaks to this sort of earlier moment in which sort of the proletarian revolution will take power and will overthrow the bourgeoisie and will sort of repeat the bourgeoisie in its most heroic phase. So that the problem posed by 1848, to the extent that Trotsky recognized it, was not one that could be dwelt on because it would have sort of I think to him seemed to have paralyzed political consciousness. I mean, I'm not sure really. It's just that I just kept being struck by it. I mean, I also think Thermidor is a real problem as a metaphor. I mean, I, saying that Stalinism was Thermidor, and and you know Trotsky raises this metaphor early on. He raises it in the time the left up. He says Thermidor has not yet occurred. He talks about it. We, it isn't time to break with the international. And then after Hitler, he says, okay, Thermidor has occurred. And it, it's, 
it's a it's a difficulty. I don't I don't think Thermidor really fully works as a metaphor. I don't have a better metaphor. Um, but I, I think that it's that it's a it's a complicated problem. Anyway, Pam. Um, yeah, I guess last week in this long out, maybe two weeks ago during the discussion period, and maybe last week also, we just talked about like how to evaluate the um, value of something like Trotsky's thought, not Trotskyism, Trotsky's thought, like in this moment, that if um, the way in which she characterized it was that. Um, like, or Chris characterized this way, this, but I don't think you disagree that, like, that Trotsky thought that Stalin was um, misrecognizing potential historical possibilities that were available, and thus was undermining like a further like you know, revolutionizing process. But we can't obviously know like how correct he was, like if things were possible. I mean, to the extent we can like sort of hypothesize that other possibilities could have been. You know, available, but so without that, then you know, on what like what value is sort of Trotsky's legacy in this early period to us? And I don't know one thing that you said, and it was during like the fascist period, but you said that like the Soviet Union had become recognized even by liberals as sort of like great power against fascism, but that Trotskyism within this period plays a particular role, and that's the memory of the Soviet Union as a political idea and as a kind of historical memory of its revolutionary ideals. And I wonder, um, just going back to the beginning of what you said, which was Trotsky as a kind of classical Marxism in extremists, because that seems to actually coincide a great deal with this um, thinking about the recurring 1848 memory. Um, that, that formulation of like, you know, Trotsky is classical Marxism and extremists. To me, like, raises the memory of how one understands the 1848 moment um, through something like the early 20th century. Anyway, so again, like, how does that one um, evaluate the value of something like Trotsky's thought if one is not really talking about the correctness of his positions vis-a-vis, -vis, like, these moments in, in history? Um, mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Just well, uh, repeat the question. Oh, yeah. Oh, so I Just guess the, the question was um, how one evaluates uh, the significance of Trotsky's thought if one isn't interested in sort of evaluating the correctness of his positions. Or if one can't. Or if one can't. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think... I think, and also the question was the problem with the sort of the memory of 1848. Um, if Trotskyism is classical Marxism. Right. I mean, I think that the way in which sort of a classical Marxism understood 1848 was of something that would be outgrown, that, that sort of 1848 wasn't some kind of fundamental turning point or was a turning point because it opened the way to Marxism as an understanding that it opened that 1848 was above all the difference between like a liberal understanding of the left or a radical liberal and a, and a Marxist understanding of the tasks of the left um, that's why I said that like the, the point about 1848 I think Trotsky and second international radicals would have understood it as fact, but it wouldn't have meant the same thing to them. I mean, it's not that they would have disagreed with the importance, but they would have like, felt its meaning in a completely different way. Um, I mean, this is somewhat of a non sequitur, but I mean, it's, it's interesting, I've been reading about the right opposition, you know, the, the Bucharinists and the people. So there was also an opposition that went on through the 30s, um, a large part of the 30s, and not as significant as Trotsky. And what's interesting about them is that they criticized the foreign policy of the Soviet Union, but didn't criticize domestic policy. Um, so that, that there were a lot of criticisms of the Soviet Union's policy vis-a-vis -vis other communist parties, but not vis-a-vis -vis 
um, you know, for example, the whole question of the need for a united front, and so, so yeah, I, 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 I I'm. What about the ballet of Marx? I mean, of Trotsky. Like, what about that? Like, I mean, I, I think, I think the main. The main question of the value of Trotskyism is that Trotskyism was really the classical Marxist response to Stalinism. That, that it, it was the response that maintained the idea of the revolutionary tradition without conceding to Stalinism. So I think that without Trotskyism, how one thinks about Stalinism has to be radically different. I mean, this is where the whole question of the relationship of Leninism to Stalinism. It's how, how does one maintain some memory of 1917 as a progressive or emancipatory moment without... Trotsky and Trotskyism. I don't think that it can be done. I think that 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 it gets obscure. I think that it's Trotsky and Trotskyism that precisely provide the link to that emancipatory significance of 1917. And I think that's why the whole question, which we have to get into in like the next session, about the question of the continuity of the Soviet Union, of whether the Soviet Union continued to represent something. I mean, also... I think that in terms of the chronology, I think that liberals in the 1930s who were pro-Soviet but and or pro-Soviet as in pro-Stalinist liberalism and the sympathy, I think that's because they understood the Soviet Union and it's a distortion but it also to represent in some way enlightenment values. So for them, the Soviet Union actually did represent kind of bourgeois radicalism. I mean, that's the, the flip side of the Jacobinism. Um, so there's a question from Philly here. Uh, how, does Trots, how does the platypus thesis of regression differ from Trotsky's crisis of proletarian leadership? Well, it differs... Um, it differs, first of all, in the sense that we're not clearly providing leadership to the masses. I mean, we're desperately struggling to provide leadership to a few intellectuals. But, so that's one thing. I mean, we're not, we're not actually engaged in a directly political project. And the other thing is I, I think that Trotsky took for granted the, the class struggle that certain types of political crises would just be thrown up by capitalist society. So he didn't ever have to deal with a world in which fundamentals of Marxism had become so obscured and the masses had become so depoliticized. I mean, you're talking about a, t a, a period, you know, like, I mean, there was a real revolution going on in Spain. You know, millions of French workers were socialist and communists. Uh, even in the United States, there were, you know, general stripes. There was a massive radicalization. It was a radically different world and a lot of basic assumptions about Marxism could be taken for granted by Trotsky. You know, he didn't, he didn't, we, we're kind of constantly struggling with the basics, trying to, you know, and, and the significance of the Bolshevik Revolution was sort of obvious to everybody. I mean, you know, 20 years after the Bolshevik Revolution, to say, well, the Bolshevik Revolution was a event of world historical significance it wasn't it wasn't something you had to argue with or argue so regression is something much deeper I mean it, it's something that um, that affects our own consciousness so we we are constantly sort of interrogating our own consciousness um, which Trotsky really wasn't I mean he took for granted the clarity of his own consciousness about the historical period. He was just upbraiding others about their failures. Um, with 1933, um, especially referring back to your article 
uh, of the decline of the world in the 20th century. Um, you make reference to kind of the, the, sort of two central like inspirations, at least theoretically, to the plot of this team. Uh, Trotskyism and its legacy, as well as um, Crawford School critical theory, and you um, you make the distinction that probably of the two, Trotsky and Trotskyists understood the Soviet Union better than the uh, Crawford School critical theorists did, whereas the Crawford School critical theorists understood Nazism better than uh, Trotsky and the Trotskyists. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe just uh, elaborate on why you think that's the case. Well, I think partly it was the geography. I mean, obviously, Trotsky was living in the Soviet Union and watched the rise, was a central actor. Um, and he was Russian, and you know, he was much more familiar with it. But I think it's also partly the, the character of the two movements. I mean, Stalinism still, in some deformed way, partakes of an Enlightenment character. I mean, of the two, it has the more rational character. And there's a way in which the truly irrational character of Nazism, the way the masses could succumb to uh, irrational motivations, I think that was something that Trotsky could recognize to some extent, but it was something he always held at arm's length. It was something that, again, that he was not really comfortable with. And there's an element of, you know, I mean, there's, there's a passage where in one of the readings that he talks about, like, the threat of anti-Semitism, right? And, you know, Trotsky on anti-Semitism in the 30s and Nazism, and even, like, in a way, predicting the Holocaust is very good. But I, I, I think there's some way in which, like, the... Trotsky couldn't quite deal with the profoundly irrational aspects of... I mean, he, he, I think that he tended to, to still see politics largely in terms of sort of questions of rational class interests. And there was an element of Nazism that, you know, he said, well, it's the petty Bush was the run them up. But it, but it was something also clearly beyond just the petty Bush was the running them up, although it's one level that was an adequate explanation. So, so politically, Trotsky's response to Nazism was good. But I think that the full depth of what it implied was something that he and his followers didn't get. I mean, I read that passage about like the Socialist Workers Party ludicrous expectations about you know what would happen after the war. And Trotsky had very optimistic views, you know, the Second World War, which, and I don't think that he understood how deeply and profoundly Nazism could destroy or said the same thing about Stalinism, destroy the class consciousness of the workers. Just briefly. Um, There's one other question we need to ask. So can this just wait for our discussion? Yeah. yeah okay. Um, okay, last question is uh, in from Boston. Uh, last week, Chris mentioned that Trotsky was not talking to the air. Uh, who was Trotsky talking to in the third, 1933 to 39, and fourth, uh, 39 to 40 phases of Trotskyism that you mentioned? Um, okay, so... Basically, from 1929, well, from 1929 to 1933, Trotsky was talking to uh, communists. Uh, from 1933 on, he was talking to radical workers and intellectuals, which meant both socialists and communists. Um, so, for example, in the United States, the first Trotskyist organization, which was established right after the expulsion of uh, Cannon and Shackman and Aber, was the Communist League of America. The Communist League of America was very small. It was basically people who had been kicked out of the Communist Party, and it basically talked to members of the Communist Party, explaining why Trotsky was right and Stalin was wrong. So it was trying to win over people who are communists. It wasn't talking to the general uh, public. After that, um, you know, you had this... this French turn, which is based on the idea that Trotsky thought his French followers should go into the French socialist 
Party, the Section Française Internationale Ouvrière, and there was a similar move in the United States. So a lot of people entered the Socialist Party, and then they took a lot of radical youth from the Socialist Party. So, um, and Trotsky was doing a lot of writing for the general public. He was actually a quite well-paid author, so you had things like the history of the Russian Revolution. So he's appealing to a general left audience, particularly sort of uh, commun people who are already mostly communist or socialist, um, which was a lot of people in those days. Great. Uh, I think that is... I just, I just wanted, oh, yeah, please. I just want to say one thing also on the question. I mean, the other point about Trotsky and the Frankfurt School is Trotsky dealt politically with both the issue of Stalinism and Nazism for a variety of reasons which are complex, and I wouldn't necessarily criticize them for. The Frankfurt School tended to be somewhat oblique on the question of Stalinism. It was much more direct on the question of Nazism. So that's also part of what I was thinking of. But again, that was just this parenthetical comment, not a criticism of either Trotsky or the Frankfurt School. All right. Uh, then that is uh, it for today.